Tell women, you know, I'll have them write a letter to their future self. This is who you're feeling like right now. So let's write a letter to who you're going to be once we get you feeling better, once we get you sleeping and your anxiety is under control and, you know, you're feeling back to who you know you can be. So we're going to write a letter to her and then when we're done with this whole process, we're going to read it and see how close we got. And that can also be really empowering for women because it's hard to picture going from A to B. You know, so it's like you can't see the other side and you don't know how great you're going to feel because you just are so stuck in where you are right now. And so taking these little bitty steps, starting to exercise, make small changes in your diet, decreasing your stress, getting better sleep, all of these things over time are definitely going to be an improvement and you're going to have a better quality of life. Welcome to Only the Greatest Podcast. If you're feeling stuck and unsure what to do next in your fitness journey, we might be what you're looking for. My name is Philip. I own and operate OTG Fitness, which is a private personal training gym on the south side of Houston in Webster. I do this podcast every week with my best friend, Daryl. We've been friends since third grade and working out together ever since. Also joining us today will be Sean. He's the one that makes this podcast not only sound great, but look good as well. Our goal here is to help Houston make its way up the ladder of health and fitness. So if you're in the Houston area and ready to become the greatest version of yourself, be sure to like and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. Kristen Clethermis is a conventionally trained and certified nurse practitioner turned functional health coach and founder of Kristen Lee Wellness. She helps women all over the U.S. heal the actual root cause of their hormone, mood, fatigue, and sleep issues for good. She does this with functional lab testing and individualized protocols for each patient. In today's episode, we discuss what exactly perimenopause is, how to determine if the transition into menopause is the cause of issues, and what to do about it if it is. If today's show helps you out in any way, please consider subscribing and sharing with anyone that you think could benefit. Kristen Clethermis, thank you so much for being here. Um, why don't you tell us what is perimenopause and how may uh, a woman know when this period is starting? Um, well, thank you so much for having me. Sure. I'm um, glad to be here. Um, so perimenopause is can happen anytime between 10 to 15 years before a woman even hits menopause, um, which makes it challenging. But it is when the estrogen and progesterone in a woman's body starts to fluctuate. Um, so one day it may be high, one day it may be low, um, which also makes it kind of challenging to really pinpoint the time that they go into this transition in their life. Um, so there's not really um, a lab test or anything specific in the perimenopausal phase that gives you a, this is happening, this is, you're in perimenopause. It's more of symptoms um, that kind of help you decide if you're transitioning to that phase. So, so there's no hard line in the sand that says this is the thing or right. this is happening. Right. I mean, of course you can check labs. You can check a woman's estradiol. You can check their follicle stimulating hormone and you can get an idea, but because of the fluctuation, because it's not consistent, it just makes it challenging to know. Um, based on symptoms, of course, you can just say, oh, well, because you're starting to have these symptoms and these fluctuations, then you're more than likely in a perimenopausal state. You said in 10 to 15 years before actual menopause happens? Correct. And I'll, I'll say this too real quick. Uh, a lot of the things that I'm going to be asking you are just like my, my uh, you know, personal questions as mm -hmm. well that I'd like to know because this is something as a personal trainer, I do have this um, discussion with women often. You know, and sometimes they feel a little uncomfortable and I tell them, hey, don't worry. I've been doing this for a long time. This is a conversation you know, that I have with women often. So I think that the best thing that you can do is be open with me so mm -hmm. I can do my best to guide you. So I, I feel like today I'm going to learn a lot as well that I can take this knowledge and, and, and help more clients, hopefully. Absolutely. And so that being said, 10 to 15 years, have you seen any 
determinants on when it's 10 years or when it's 15 or maybe when it's five? Is there anything that, that stands out for what could cause that to happen at what time? Not necessarily. You can look at the history of like your mom, your grandma, and kind of see if you're going to have a similar experience as them. But there's no um, kind of like if you had this experience, then you're going to have, you know, if your cycle started younger or um, that type of thing in your um that you're going to have perimenopause in your 30s as opposed to potentially not even until your late 40s or 50s. Um, That's kind of why it's also so challenging, and I think a lot of people don't talk about it because there is not a lot of guidance. It's just more of, okay, well, here's your symptoms. This is kind of the state we think you're in, and then let's work on the symptoms to improve it until you hit menopause. And that is a little bit easier to kind of decide. Yeah, you can actually dial in. There's a definite answer of Correct. when that happens. Correct. Right. Correct. And you said, so you do feel like there is some genetic predisposition to the timing? Yeah, they say, you know, research shows that you can kind of look at, okay, well, did your mom have terrible hot flashes? Did your mom go into menopause at an early age? Um, average menopause is 51. So did she go into menopause in her 30s or 40s? Um, and why did she go into menopause at that young? You know, it's ovarian failure, ovarian, you know, your ovaries stop producing estrogen. Um, And so you stop ovulating. These are what cause a lot of the symptoms that women have that are, you know, hard to deal with, um, hard to manage sometimes. So you can look at that and see. But once again, it's not just because this happened to your mom or your grandma that this is how you're going to be. But it is a good indication. And how often... Like if I were to ask, like um, if I were to ask you or you were to ask your mother, mm-hmm. maybe she didn't even know. Correct. Because there's so much of this up in the air stuff. So is that something you see like you're trying to figure it out, but you can't really, because they don't, they don't know either. Well, yeah, because a lot of times these symptoms come into play so gradually. It's not like you just wake up one day and boom, you have 10 symptoms of perimenopause or menopause. Some women do unfortunately, but most of the time it's just this gradual progression into this anxiety and into, you know, brain fog. And so you're not pinpointing those symptoms as, oh, I must be in perimenopause, which is another reason why it's so great to talk about it because people don't even associate the things together. Um, So, so yeah, it's. Yeah. I I had no clue that it could show up that soon, mm-hmm. 10 to 15 years. Why Why isn't this uh, a more known thing? I think that a lot of people, you know, even in traditional medicine, when I went and uh, got my nurse practitioner, we kind of just skim over it. It's not something that we focus on. It's more like, okay, your cycle, then getting pregnant, um, and then menopause. And it's probably just because of all the fluctuation and there's no real test to it. Um, Even research, you know, a lot of women in this perimenopausal state are excluded from research because of the fact of we have fluctuating hormones and they don't know what to do about it. They don't know how to use that as a guide because there's no consistency. Yeah, I have noticed this when it comes to, to research, which is this is a very positive thing about research and even in, in us, like in the fitness world, and this probably happens in the medical world as well, unless things are definite, mm-hmm. it's very difficult to kind of put your finger on it. And it's also right. very difficult to, in, in fitness, I've noticed they don't want to like fund studies. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of the, the funding doesn't come through because there's really no decisions that can be made off the back of it. Correct. Do you feel like that's going on? For sure, because there's too many variables. Right. And so you can't say, well, oh, okay, we're going to try this placebo or this medicine, but then this woman has X, Y, Z happening, but this woman doesn't, you know, so there's no way to to determine what is actually affecting their body and what isn't. And so it kind of just excludes that whole time frame from like 35 to 50s. Yeah, there's no ta- there's not enough tangibles you exactly. know, to, to be adequate with the research and things like that. You said it's very gradual. So do you want to maybe talk a little bit about what that graduation looks like over sure. time? How, you know, you said <clears throat> it could start 10 to 15 years. So is it slowly over 15 years? Like, you know, I feel a little bit of something, then a little more, then a little more. Like w- what's going on? What am 
what is a, a woman starting to feel, you know, when that's creeping on and how, what does that gradual process look like? Sure. And I, the gradual process obviously is going to be different for every woman. I mean, some women go through perimenopause and they hit menopause in two years, but it's just knowing that some of the symptoms you're experiencing in your mid to late thirties, even early forties could be due to some of these hormone fluctuations. So usually it's, um, you start to notice your cycles change. So women start to either have shortened periods, longer periods, um, heavier, um, those type of things. Um, they start to have brain fog. So they feel like they are thinking through, you know, mud and they lose their words. They are trying to have a conversation and then boom, that thought is gone. Um, mood swings, so anxiety, depression, irritability, all of those things can come. Um, and, and that, you know, can also be where people think, oh, well, I'm having these mood swings because my kids are stressing me out or I'm stressed about my job or, you know, it's just this time in my life when really, no, there's a reason that you feel this way. Um, vaginal dryness, low libido, um, hot flashes, night sweats, um, you wake up in the middle of the night and need to change your clothes or you're kicking off covers um, or freezing the rest of your family out. Those can be definite symptoms. Um, insomnia, that's a really big one, either having a hard time falling asleep or staying asleep. That can be a big thing. And due to some of those symptoms, then you're exhausted the next day. Um, so all of those things can be part of the perimenopausal state. You kind of read my mind earlier because as you were mentioning like the time frame of age when this can start and you started naming the things I'm like you know a lot of that sounds like kind of stress related. Mm -hmm. So how does someone determine if it is just life circumstances versus actually going into this perimenopause phase like you're mentioning? Is that something that can easily be figured out or like how, how do we how do we figure that out? I think that either way you still would be working on some of the same things. So we know that as we get into perimenopause um, and our estrogen starts to drop, um, our adrenals and our stress and cortisol levels start to go up. Um, and so, yes, we're getting stress. And it doesn't really matter if that's internal or external stress. You know, is that because there's things happening in my body or am I causing stress on my body? Um, so working on your stress level um, definitely is going to help. Working on your sleep, circadian rhythm is definitely going to help. Um, working on your nutrition, your exercise, um, all of those things are going to still be beneficial. And then once you work on that and you still feel like something's off, well, then maybe that's time to say, okay, well, what are your hormones looking like? Is it time for you to start getting some type of, you know, hormonal, um, replacement therapy, either through your diet, um, or through, you know, external matters. Yeah. So no matter what we want to try to fix all of these things, right. And I want to get into those <coughs> a, a little mm -hmm, bit later mm -hmm. too, kind of more specifics with mm -hmm. nutrition and exercise and stuff like that. But if you really are putting in a good effort into those things, which all people should do. Correct. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, well, here's a question too, or let, I, let me finish my thought first, I guess. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> that you should try to do all these things. And if you still feel problems, then it could be this issue that you should seek help for. Correct. Okay. So speaking of all those things, what percentage of women that are struggling with this are, do have a lot of these things dialed in already? Maybe they've been a really healthy individual, someone focused on their health, exercise, eating well, they have good stress management um, through their 20s, through their 30s, and even into their 40s and stuff like that. Do you see those people, types of people struggle less or do they kind of go through these issues also? They definitely go through these issues. I think that some people who are already really well in tuned with their body um, may notice these changes a little bit easier because they know that, hey, look, I'm already exercising, I'm eating right, you know, I'm limiting alcohol, I'm limiting gluten, I'm limiting dairy, I'm limiting the things that I know can cause inflammation in my body. Um, and so they may be a little bit more in tune to think about there's an, another reason as opposed to someone who maybe has never had to do that, or maybe never even been aware that that was something that was important for health. 
Um, so I don't think that there's a percentage that I could really think of off the top of my head. Um, I don't think it's something everyone really, though, thinks about. Yeah, that's a really good point that I didn't consider. <clears throat> because what I do know is that when it, like, once again, I'm a personal trainer, right? Mm-hmm. So I'm helping people exercise. And one thing that I've noticed is people that work out regularly uh, have better what I call body awareness. Mm-hmm. Like some people are just so, and I'm not trying to pick on anyone, but I'm just making an example right now. You're like, all right, guys, let's get our hips back. And they're just like, they like go sideways or something. Right, <laughs> right. Like they, What's a hip? Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Right, you know, right. when, when some, sometimes people just don't have very high body awareness. Mm-hmm. So maybe what you're saying is, these symptoms are happening in the background and they're just not noticing as well. Correct. Because they're not as in tune with their body. Correct. Or they're so distracted by the rest of their life that, you know, most women, I would say, are nurturers. We give to everyone else and we put ourselves on the back burner. And so they're not even thinking about what is potentially happening with them. It's just like, well, this is what I have to do today. This is what I got to do, you know, for X, Y, Z tomorrow. And I'm just going to have to deal with these symptoms. And one day I'll worry about myself, you know. Yeah, let's talk about that a little bit. Let's talk about why, you know, this period of time is so difficult and why women do that. We had, um, we've had a guest on in the past that uh, specifically helped women and we talk about empowering women and things like that. And a lot of things that that you're talking about here. Um, She said that uh, you always have to feel like Wonder Woman Mm -hmm. at all times. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's a big issue here as well? Very much so. Can you speak on that a little bit? Like what are your, your thoughts behind why that's happening and then also how it kind of interferes with, with this issue that we're talking about? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I see women come in and, and see me all the time who are literally, they almost wait until they're at their breaking point um, to where it is destroying their marriage or they no longer, you know, can take care of their ill parents or, you know, their kids are about to go off to college and they just don't even know what they're going to do with their lives. And they're just very, very... Um, stress because they've ignored themselves and ignored their symptoms for so long. So another reason why I love talking about this is because I do want women to be aware that, hey, your symptoms are real. What you're going through is real. You don't need to be ignored. And if people are not hearing you and are just brushing you off, then you need to find someone else who is. Um, You also need to realize that when you are not at your best, then you can't provide for anyone else at their best. So you need to really take time for yourself and whatever that can look at a different for everyone. Um, But it is very important. um, And the longevity and your life happiness is just going to be so much better when you do that as soon, you know, the earlier, the better. Yeah. Something I like to say is if you, become a little more selfish now, Mm -hmm. you can be more selfless later. Mm -hmm. Why do women struggle with that, though? Um, Really good question. I I think that we just, you know, for the majority of us, it's just who we are. You know, we're nurturers. We are supposed to, I mean, you know, is it from way back when, when we were supposed to be the ones who took care of the house and took care of the kids and did all the things? And as the years have gone on, thankfully, that is not I don't think the the big picture anymore, um, but we still do that and have full time jobs and we try to keep up with the latest you know and greatest trends and um, so, so social media and all that we see out there that we think we need you know this all these things to make us happy when um, and I think it just causes more stress on ourselves and our body which is detrimental in all aspects mm-hmm. and then it just compounds. And compounds and Mm -hmm. compounds over Mm -hmm. time. Correct. Right. Can you speak on the repercussions of (coughs) waiting so long to do something about this? So the earlier you get these things under control, the better menopause is going to be and the better your life longevity is going to be. This is more than just symptoms. This is also your bone health, your cardiovascular health, your brain health. Um, There is increased risk of osteoporosis, Alzheimer's, um, cardiovascular disease as our hormones shift. So the earlier we start taking care of our body, um, the better that we're going to have, you know, chances of long living a long life 
and getting our, you know, not developing osteoporosis. So when we're 80, we don't fall and break a hip or not having Alzheimer's, being around for our family and friends and whomever um, for as long as possible. You said the better menopause is going to be. <clears throat> Correct. Can you speak on what a good menopause <laughs> looks like? <laughs> yeah. Um, so menopause usually, you know, it's, it's definitely when your estrogen goes to zero. And that um, is when women can really start to have the worsening of the symptoms because there is no um, fluctuation in your estrogen to where, you know, one day you feel like, crap, but then the next day you're like, okay, okay, I can do this. It's, it's gone. Now you're having hot flashes, night sweats, vaginal dryness, painful intercourse, um, low libido. So it starts to take a toll on your relationships potentially. Um, you're having brain fog, you're having, um, terrible time sleeping, you're gaining weight. Um, and so your mood is just changed. Um, the anxiety that you have is not like you had before. Um, and so when you get ahead of this and when you learn how to manage certain things like your stress, like your sleep, your circadian rhythm, you know the foods that you need to give your body and the exercise that your body needs because that changes as we age, then it's going to make that transition so much smoother. Mm -hmm. You mentioned uh, it's when estrogen goes to zero. Correct. Right. Are you <clears throat> using hormone replacement? So you definitely can use hormone replacement therapy, um, and there are certain foods, there are certain supplements um, that you can definitely add in. There's also, um, of course, patches and creams and pellets that you could also talk to your doctor or find um, someone that you trust that is in that space to um, get those things from. So do you, um, and you specifically, uh, how, how do you get started? Like, say someone thinks they're in this phase and they're, they're early. Let's talk about two different scenarios. Mm -hmm. Someone comes to you, they're 30, 31. That's pretty young, right? Mm -hmm. That'd be on the younger side of mm -hmm. this equation. And then maybe we'll talk about someone in that, their mid forties as well. So someone comes to you early thirties. Hey, this is what's going on. They've already tried all the things. Mm -hmm. Okay. They've tried, they're eating well, they're focused on their sleep. Um, you know, all they're exercising, mm -hmm. right? What do we do now? So I think it's still important to, when you say that they're eating right, I mean, what does that mean? You know, so, great question. <laughs> That's a great question. <laughs> yeah. I could have figured that one out. Yeah. You know, because um, eating right to one person is not eating right to the next person. And so, and our body needs different things. So that would be one of the things that I would discuss is, okay, well, let's go through a day, a week of what you're eating and how you're feeling. And then go from there. Even sometimes continuous glucose monitors can be really helpful for that. Um, same thing with exercise. What type of exercise are we doing? How much stress are we putting on the body? Exercise is great, but not all exercise, once again, do you need at each phase of your life. It needs to be adjusted. Um, so we get that under control, you know, and we're like, okay, you are eating the right stuff. You are doing the right exercise, but you still aren't feeling great. Well, then let's work on your stress. What is your cortisol doing? Um, what is your circadian look like? Um, what when you say cortisol, you're testing for that? Correct. Yeah, like a saliva test. Mm -hmm. um, so it has to be a four-point saliva test. A blood test of cortisol gives you no info. Interesting. Um, yeah. Why? Because it's just a one point in time. You have to know what it, your cortisol is doing throughout the day to really get a good picture of how it's, you know, benefiting you or hindering you. So you do it four times throughout the day? Correct. It's a, a like a spit test that you can just I spit do one of these. Things. Yeah. Interesting. It's pretty fascinating. Yeah. Um, and then same thing with nighttime routines and, you know, AM routines and your stress. So, I think that the 31 year old definitely, because the sooner she learns those things, then man, all of the rest, you know, she'll learn how to take her body from a fight or flight um, to this rest and relax state that we need to be in, which is very important for so many aspects of our lives and hormones and stuff. How do, how do we do that? Let's talk specifics. Sure. So, um, a couple of different things, um, you know, one thing that's simple that people don't think of is how we eat, um, especially moms and people fat, you know, on the go, we're just like eating really quickly, we're not sitting down to eat, we're kind of mindlessly eating, 
um, or we're eating in the car when we're, you know, taking our kids someplace. Um, and so sitting down, taking a couple of minutes, you're going to take in some deep breaths, count to four, hold for four, and then release for four. Those simple acts get yourself into a parasympathetic state. And so it gets your digestion ready to receive food, um, which helps on, you know, gut health and all of these things. So that's one simple thing that people can do just day in and day out. Um, Then there's, of course, meditation, yoga, um, limiting screen time, um, getting sunshine first thing in the morning, um, just to kind of get yourself calm because we we're just a busy, busy, you know, society. We're on the same wavelength right yeah. now. <laughs> yeah. like the, that, the advice that you gave about the food. Um, yeah. I don't know if we talked very much about like, um, my past, but I lost almost a hundred pounds and it it's amazing. Re- really changed my life. And one of the main things that I did, and I often give people not necessarily the counts of four out to four. I'm going to start doing that though. Um, but something that I recommend a lot of people do is very similar is before you eat, one, don't eat standing. Mm-hmm. Never eat standing. Mm-hmm. Always sit down, relax. Mm-hmm. And but so you're sitting down, food's in front of you. Ask yourself, what is it? What is it doing for mm-hmm. me? Mm-hmm. And why am I eating it? Mm-hmm. It takes you 30, 45 seconds. You answer the questions and then you eat. Yep. And by doing that, yeah, it just it just calms you down. It relaxes you. It keeps you from eating so fast that you start to overeat. Correct. Right. Yeah. That's their um, ama- amazing piece of advice. Don't eat with your TV on. Okay, that's a good one. I do, I, I do that one. I, yeah. I, I, yeah, I always, wa- I'm always watching something yeah, while I, I'm eating. I actually do that. Like, um, I'll sit down, I'll have my food, and it'll be sitting there, and then I'll like find something interesting on YouTube or something, and yeah. I will watch that while yeah. while I eat. Is there a specific reason you recommend not to do that? We tend to overeat because it distracts us, and so we're not paying attention to our body, and when we actually get full, and so we mindlessly once again are just eating because our focus is really on whatever we're watching. Um, so it's important to, you know, yeah, I pay attention agree. to your body. I can see that. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. I think that's yeah. great. Speaking of food, do you mind if we stay on food for a little yeah, bit? Food, for sure. Food's my jam. Yep. That, that's my, I like food too. This is what I like, <laughs> this is what I like to talk about. So uh, do you have any specifics as far as um, protocols though? You know, you're talking about not mindlessly eating, which is amazing. And I think that 90% of people probably need to do a better job of that. For sure. Right? Mm-hmm. But let's talk about the person that is doing that. And now, do you have specifics as far as carbohydrate intake, protein intake, mm-hmm. vitamins, minerals, yep. meal timing? Yep. You mind if we kind of dig into all that kind for of stuff? For sure. For yeah, sure. Let's talk about it. So, um, obviously, protein is very important um, for a lot of reasons. But... Um, in, once we get into perimenopause and even menopause, um, you know, women are three times, it's three times more difficult for women in menopause to um, maintain muscle mass. So we have to make sure that they're getting enough protein, um, which can range from anywhere between 80 to 100 grams. Some women may need more. Um, your body frame matters, how tall you are, your goals, are you trying to maintain, are you trying to lose, you know. Um, so that can fluctuate, but at minimum, um, I would say 30 to 40 grams a meal is really important for protein because um, that's also going to help you maintain your muscle mass. And we know that muscle mass is um, important for longevity of life. So it's, e- it's really, really important. Um, definitely need fiber. Um, fiber obviously is important for digestion. Um, and just a side note with the way that we eat, we always should be eating our fiber first. Um, Think of it as a brush for our digestive system. So you eat your fiber, it goes in and it cleans your GI tract and allows your food to come in and be digested better um, to hopefully help with, you know, um, bloating and um, constipation, diarrhea, things of that nature. Um, So with carbs, I like to keep carbs less than 50 grams. Um, And then healthy fats, of course. Um, So each meal um, needs to have Protein, healthy fats, complex carbs, and fiber. Breakfast, lunch, dinner. You need to have all of those, um, which I did not get this morning. We um, are speaking <laughs> We are speaking the same language, though. Yeah. This yeah. is amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's very important um, for our muscle, for our brain, for our gut, for all of the things. Even, um, you know... 
people wake up in the middle of the night between 2 and 4 a.m. And they're like, why do I keep waking up? And I'm like, well, there's two things that we need to look at. Is it your protein intake? Because your blood sugar, you know, our our detox starts from our liver between 1 and 2 a.m. So are you waking up at 2 a.m. because your blood sugar just dropped and you didn't get enough protein throughout the day and so your body's waking up? Or is it your cortisol's off? And you're having a spike in your cortisol. Once again, that circadian rhythm is off. Um, And so those are two things that I like to look at. But I usually suggest protein first because that's an easy fix. And you don't have to test for that. You know, just look, you are definitely not eating enough protein. Let's start there. See how your sleep changes. And then we can try other things. Yeah. So you're saying three to four meals a day of 30 to 40 grams of protein get you your 100. Very similar recommendations Mm -hmm. to what we do at at the gym, at OTG Mm -hmm. with our clients, with a lot of females, I tell them a hundred would be an amazing number for you to get to. Something that you said that I'd like you to expand on if you don't mind, because you you said protein and blood sugar. Those are two things that people don't often equate, right? They Mm -hmm. think blood sugar, carbs, blood sugar, sugar. Can you talk about why protein is important for blood sugar and how the complexity of the meal with protein and carbohydrate, which I'm just assuming is, is what you're getting at, how that affects blood sugar? So when we're not eating enough protein, then, you know, that is what keeps us full throughout the day. Um, for example, if you just eat um, what I call naked carbs, you know, a bag of chips, a piece of bread, some crackers without any protein, your body is burning through that sucker quick. Um, and so you're going to have these spikes and drops in your blood sugar, which is going to spike and drop your insulin. You're going to have more insulin resistance. You're going to gain weight, all these things that kind of come into play when you have protein, then that is keeping you full longer. And so you're not going to have these spikes and drops in your blood sugar. Um, and so you're going to have less insulin resistance. You're going to have more of a steady, um, kind of, you know, balanced um, blood sugar regulation. Hence, you would sleep better because you're not having the the drop in the middle of the night that wakes you up. Yeah, amazing stuff. That's something that is often overlooked. And I really like your term, naked carbs. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, I I, I tell everyone, like a a big recommendation is to always have, and you said it too, Mm -hmm. protein, carbs, fats. Try Mm -hmm. to have whole food items, single Mm -hmm. ingredients. Learn how to associate the, the different macronutrients on your plate. Absolutely. Right. And, and never have a meal without all three, because mm-hmm. that's what we would consider a snack. And Correct. we're not fans of snacks. Correct. Right. We want to have whole food meals, whole food meals, three to four times a day mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. to sustain blood sugar, mm-hmm. get enough protein, feel good at all times. Exactly. Amazing. Does that protocol change though? If we're talking to the 45 to 50 year old that is in a similar situation? Not necessarily with the protein. Um, Some women, as they get into menopause, their fat intake and their complex carb intake can fluctuate. But that is on an individual basis. um, And that's usually due to how their body is processing it in relation to like their gut health, um, of course their hormones. um, But that is not you know, a general statement. It's more of, well, let's just see. And most people by then know like, hey, when I eat a lot of fat, um, I feel terrible or I'm, you know, really bloated. Or do you need to eat carbs um, in the, you know, beginning part of the day, not the afternoon because they kind of crash you. So there also could be some, you know, time management on when we eat certain things as well. And how, how do people figure that out for themselves? Um, I think the best way to figure it out is to to change it. You know, it's like, okay, well, if you eat carbs and you start to notice that throughout the day you're crashing, well, let's stop eating carbs after lunch. Let's, you know, rein it in a little bit and do that for a couple of weeks and see if it makes a difference. Um, And that's a good indication. Yeah, something I often recommend is to use a food journal Mm -hmm. and you write down your food and then also write down how you feel. Yes. Right. So you write down what, what, write down what you eat at what time it is. And then also write down how you feel throughout the day. And let's start to make some associations. Absolutely. You know, um, between the two things, because you only get out of your body, what you put in it. Mm -hmm. Right. So, uh, what you put in it affects how you feel. Yes. A hundred percent. But because of what you said earlier, life's so fast. Mm -hmm. Kids are here. 
uh, the rest of the family's over there. Work needs me to do this. Baseball team <laughs> needs me to do that. Yeah. Like whatever the thing is. And now you're not even associating right. what you're eating with how you feel. Yeah. Your kids like chicken nuggets and mac and cheese. You're eating chicken nuggets and mac and cheese. You know, it's just, or you're snacking on theirs before you actually sit down for your meal or whatever. Yeah. Do you have any recommendations on that specifically? Because that is something that uh, I hear a lot of women talking about, which is, ah, uh, my kids are picky. They only like these things. You know, um, is that something that you help your clients with? Um, I do. And I help my, I try to help my own kids cause I, I can relate. Um, my one daughter is very, very picky. Um, I still, I still think that, you know, you have to give your kids what they'll eat. Obviously, um, you can still limit the things that, um, are unhealthy, not just giving them sugar all the time. Um, but knowing that you still need to fuel yourself. So sure, if your kid is only going to eat chicken nuggets and mac and cheese, find one vegetable that they'll eat. My kids will only eat broccoli. What do we have every single night? Broccoli. <laughs> I don't care that they have the same thing every single night because, you know, they're getting something. Um, and so same thing for you. I mean, you have to, at the end of the day, do what works for your family because coming up with all these different meals is stressful too. Like who has time for that? Um, but it's just being conscientious of those things and saying, look, this is all, this is all the best I have tonight. Well, that's fine. Tomorrow, let's try and make a little bit, you know, more balanced plate for yourself or make sure your breakfast and lunch is balanced. I mean, we're doing the best we can sometimes. Yeah. <clears throat> Do you find success in trying to help people start to slowly change their kids' diets? Yes, I think that once um, you start to take more care of yourself and you start to educate yourself and learn more about um, whatever it is, but, you know, we're talking nutrition, so then, yes, you start to buy things differently at the grocery store. You start to see the effect on how well you feel and knowing how these things can be detrimental, these foods can be detrimental for your kids now and long term, even for their you know, their attention spans, their sleep, their learning, um, all of those things, their GI, you know, tract. Um, I definitely think that it is a um, generational change. And so when you start making these adjustments, then your kids are going to notice it and you're happier, you feel better, you're more active with them because you have the energy to do these things. Um, it definitely makes a difference. And then they'll be on board. Exactly. More on board, hopefully. And I know, um, you know, people listening to this, I like, and, and I don't have kids myself, so I really tiptoe yeah, yeah, <laughs> this yeah. line. I, I really do, and I, I understand that. Um, but it has to, it, it's very difficult to have multiple people in the household eating differently. It's very difficult. Right, that's very hard. And when it comes to the kids, I usually see two different camps. I, I, I often see um, men and women both do this, but they really try to get their kids to eat super healthy but then eat terribly themselves. Mm -hmm. I see that one. Mm -hmm. And then I see the, the other way around where they let their kids eat whatever they want and then they try to eat healthy and it just stresses them out. Yeah, and, and that's not doing anybody, you know, anything good by adding stress um, when we're trying to decrease it. So I think once again, you do the best you can. It's not bad to have ice cream every once in a while. It's not bad to have a cookie every once in a while. That's not what we're saying. It's more about balance. You know, I have an 80-20 rule. 80% 80 of the time you're eating, you know, the outer side of a grocery store, the things that you know what is it, what it is. An apple's an apple. You know, broccoli's broccoli. You're not going down those middle aisles and getting all of the processed foods. Um, every once in a while, sure, we can do that. But I think it's just... Um, trying your best to have that balance and knowing that whatever you put into your body and give your kids and show them that it is something that, you know, transitions to their health as well. Yeah. So at the end of the day, no matter what position you're in, what age, um, when it comes to this fighting through perimenopause and menopause, mm -hmm. the best that we can, mm -hmm. we should have a focus on protein, mm -hmm. eating regularly, mm -hmm. whole foods. Correct. Those are the biggest takeaways, right? 
That is correct. Uh, anything? Oh, and fiber. You mentioned and fiber. fiber. Uh, yes. any, anything else specifically before we move on on that note? Um, yes. The So it takes our GI tract, once we eat, it takes our GI tract three hours to digest our food. So we do need to wait three hours in between meals minimum. Um, and same thing with a meal before bed. Um, try to eat three hours before you go to sleep. Um, digestion at night while you're sleeping can also interrupt your, your sleep. Yeah, you know, something that used to not bother me, but does more now. And I am in the camp that, for the most part, uh, if your macronutrients and calories are the same, the meal timing is not as important. But I will say this, especially the old, I know I'm still young, but <laughs> the older that I've gotten, eating late, I do not feel good the next morning. Mm -hmm. I wake up, stomach kind of like, you know, something's just not right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But if I have a good, probably two, three or more hour gap before I go to bed after dinner, I feel much more refreshed yep. the next morning. Yeah. You've so, allowed that digestion to happen before you go to sleep. Yeah, right? and I, I've seen that change as I've gotten a little older. When I was younger, like when I was in college, I could do that. It was really no oh, problem. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, but now it, it's a major issue. So mm -hmm. uh, let's flip the script a little bit and talk about exercise. Yeah. So we have we have our two scenarios here, right? We yep. have the 31-year-old experiencing some possible perimenopause, and then we have our late 40s mm -hmm. experiencing possible perimenopause as well. We'll start with the younger sure. of the two. What type of exercise uh, are you recommending? Do you have specific protocols? Um, why don't you l lay that out for us? Sure. So the younger 31-year-old, she can still do a lot of HIT type exercises multiple days throughout the week and still pre feel pretty good and her body can tolerate it. Um, she would still need, you know, some downtime, of course, to allow that stress and inflammation from working out to come down. Um, but definitely it's a lot more manageable um, at that stage of life. When you get into the later perimenopause, even close to menopause, then um, some women think, oh, I got to amp it up because I'm starting to gain weight. And oh my gosh, I got to do more and more and more. I'm going to eat less. I'm going to change all this stuff and I'm going to work out, work out more. And that is the wrong thing to do. Um, it's more of, yes, you can still do HIIT workouts, um, probably need to be like a 30 minute time frame, maybe even 40 minute, two to three times a week, but they also need to incorporate slower things. Um, you know, just weightlifting instead of the, um, HIIT type exercises, um, or yoga, Pilates, you're still doing weight resistance and still trying to maintain that muscle, but you're not doing these quick burst movements that are causing even more inflammation. Um, and you're also not just going out and running for miles and miles and miles because um, it just causes so much more stress on your body in a, in a body that's already stressed, already trying to figure out how to process hormones and figure out how to, you know, get everything in aligned and balanced again when it's kind of all over the place. So it just adds to um, the stress. Do you see people getting in this um, negative loop when it comes to, like, let's, let's use the older, you know, mm -hmm, woman mm -hmm. here in this example. She's like, I'm trying to work out harder, you know, doing more hit. I'm, I'm running X amount of miles per week outside. Look, They're looking at their watch, how many calories they burned and stuff like mm -hmm. that. Is that something that, that you see a lot of, you know, in Very much that so. older age? How, how do they, I guess, how do you get out of that? How do you know that you're in it? Um, well, that's the challenging part, I guess, until someone kind of points it out. Um, it can be difficult because people don't think, oh, well, I need to change my workouts. No, they're like, well, this is what's always worked or this is what used to work. And so I'm going to go back to doing this. And then their body is different now. And so now they're not losing weight. Now they're not, you know, they still feel bloated. Their clothes aren't fitting like they want. Um, they still don't have the energy that they used to get from from working out. And so they keep, they do, they keep, well, I got to go harder. I got to go harder, you know, and I got to work out six days a week instead of seven or, or I'm sorry, instead of five, I've got to do two workouts a day. Um, and that just is making it worse. Um, and you're definitely not going to lose the weight um, when you're causing that much stress on your body. Are there negative repercussions to that as well? Um, I mean, I think that just because of the inflammation that it can cause um, and 
you know, the mindset and the way that we have our body image, then I think that's the, the negative repercussions. Um, sure, as we age, we also can be more prone to injury. Um, and so that can definitely be a factor um, if we're not, you know, as our hormones get lower as well, the lubrication in our joints and things of that nature changes. Um, so, so yeah, it definitely could make a difference. Yeah. I think those are really good points as well. The, the injury situation, um, just age, you know, when we're talking age at all, menopause, Mm -hmm. male, female, like doesn't matter. Um, the, the injury avoidance situation I think is really important. And that's where specifically the weightlifting, um, situation kind of comes into play exactly so do you have like let's let's talk about the younger person here do you have like a recommend a recommended amount of like the kind of higher intensity versus weightlifting versus kind of pure cardio or is it just do you just kind of try it see how you feel what do do you recommend for the younger person i would say i mean you could try it and see how you feel um because this person you know is already eating well and sleeping well and doing all the things um, a little bit more in tune with their body. So they would know like, oh, I need a rest day today, you know. And kind of feel it. Um, which is another thing that I think just everyone should be able to do is every day you kind of have a moment with yourself and say, what is my body feeling today? How does my body need me to show up for it today? And whether that means, you know, you know what, you, I'm going to lift weights today or I'm going to do a hit exercise or I'm going to rest, Um if you really start to get in tune with it, you'll you'll have a better understanding of what um, your body needs. If you're going from nothing to mm-hmm. something, mm-hmm. What, what do you what would you recommend? Um, I definitely think that I would still, you know, if we're talking someone who's never worked out, yeah, then never. sure, let's start doing a little cardio. Let's start amping up a little bit, get that heart rate up some. Um, some hit exercise would be fine. Definitely weightlifting, though. I still think weightlifting is important, even if it is just adding ankle weights as, when you walk, adding a vest when you walk, just a little bit of resistance. Um, I have a lot of people, that's all they do is walk. And so I'm like, okay, well, we're going to add in ankle wi- weights. We're going to add in a vest or whenever you're, um, you're going to walk for 10 minutes and then you're going to start doing some lunges and you're going to start doing some squats. Um, body weight is a great you know, resource for us as well. You don't always have to have weights. But you need a job. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, yeah, yeah. Oh man, sure, add me in. Yeah, yeah like, sounds like a lot of the stuff that we definitely talk about at the gym very, oh, very often. So yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Very well, that much. makes me feel better. Yeah, very, uh, very similar protocols uh, mm-hmm. or outlooks, philosophies. Mm-hmm. You know, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. How many days a week are we talking about with the weightlifting? So two days a week, good. Three. What are the what? What do you consider optimal? Where's a good place to I start? I mean, definitely three. Three. Um, I would say, um, I mean, sure, if, if you're just starting out, then once again, do your best. Mm-hmm. But um, definitely, I would say at minimum three. Um, I think that you shouldn't work out seven days a week. You always need a rest day um, and whatever that looks like. I mean, even if it's going to red light therapy or going to a sauna or something to detox all of that, um, you know, stress out of your body. Um, could be beneficial, um, or yoga is, is your rest day. Um, meditation is your rest day. Um, those would be fine too. Yeah. We, when when people ask me this question, it seems as if four days a week Mm -hmm. is actually what I consider the ideal number. Mm -hmm. And we also preach frequency over duration. Mm -hmm. Um, four seems to be the ideal number of total workouts per week. That can be a combination of, uh, strength training and cardio work, right? That gets really good results, Mm -hmm. but also is doable for people's schedule. Yes. And we also say, but you got to do at least three. Yeah. Four is what we consider ideal. Three is the minimum if you really want to get results. Because if it's less than three, you're probably taking too much time Mm -hmm. between each one and not building the habit. Exactly. Of doing it. Exactly. Right. Um, Even if you don't mind me asking this, this is more of a um, personal uh, I, w- I just want to know the w- what your thoughts are. Say post menopause mm-hmm. when it comes to exercise. Obviously, exercise is what I do. Yep. Right. I do. S- we do have clientele post menopause. Mm-hmm. What are you thinking for them? Weight resistance. Purely. A hundred percent. Um. Not not necessarily purely. Okay. Um. They can still do hit. You okay. know. I tell women all the time. You know. Just do some. 
um, squat jumps and, and things of that nature, you know, cause they are not going to jump on a box or, you know, um, that type of stuff just to get that burst of a heart rate up and then get it back down. Um, as, as you know, but, um, still, you know, menopause is three times harder to maintain that muscle mass and we need muscle mass to live longer. Um, so it is very important. Um, and we're not talking, they have to do the heaviest weights, sure. but, but sure, you know, it's like, or start at whatever weight, I don't know which weight you like to start women at, but, um, and then gradually increase. Um, and I do think that that is still the best for my postmenopausal. Yeah, because um, menopause, can you, can you talk just real <coughs> quick? Um, I feel like I have a decent understanding of this. Maybe you can help me out a little bit. Um, the effects on the bone density. Yeah, so as um, estrogen goes to zero, then we start to have bone loss. Um, there's plenty of research out there. Um, that's why we start getting DEXA scans and all these things. Um, you're going into osteopenia and then osteoporosis. Um, and so getting that muscle, that lean muscle is going to be helpful for your bones. Um, and so that definitely, you know, we don't want you to fall and break a hip because we know the chances of you recovering from that are, are pretty slim. Um, so it's definitely very important. Yeah. Uh, resistance training directly impacts yeah 100% density. 100% yeah and when we're also talking about um you know all cause mortality mm -hmm. i've seen some of these charts mm -hmm. where at a certain age i think it's 60 it might be 65 where you see falling mm -hmm. really make its way up the charts mm -hmm. and if i'm understanding the data correctly basically what's going on is any hospitalization mm -hmm. like it could be from a major fall minor fall the older that you get Unfortunately, the more and more likely that you never come back out of that hospital. Correct. And, and you're going to need more medication. Um, you're definitely going to stay in there longer. The recovery is going to be slower. Um, so, yes. Everything from the anesthesia, mm -hmm. right, to the, the stress, yep. right, um, that, that you have, you know, your willpower and things like that are all slowly but surely going down. But if we can exercise... Mm -hmm get stronger, have better, we didn't talk about balance, like yep. better balance to prevent falling, stronger bones if you do fall mm -hmm. to, to not break something. So, um, 100%. yeah, the, the weightlifting part. Um, so glad we're on the same page there yes. as well. Uh, let's talk a little, or anything else with exercise that we missed before we move on? Mm. I think we kind of covered it. Just okay. do it. Just okay. exercise. Yeah. <laughs> three, yes. <laughs> so three, at, at least three days a week. Mm -hmm. With a foundation of weightlifting, yes, and if so the especially if you, some hit is not is fine for everyone, mm -hmm. but the older that you get, you can be a little more cautious with the hit, Correct. and maybe sway that. Say if we're breaking our exercise down into let's call it three parts: we have weightlifting, we have high intensity mm -hmm. cardio, and then low intensity cardio. Mm -hmm. So the the younger that you are, the more the high intensity you can handle. Correct. The older that you get, that then um, the percentage that you allocate towards high intensity slowly goes down. Yes. And you add more to the weightlifting. Weight lifting. Yep. Perfect. Okay. Yep. Let's talk a little about supplements. Sure. Is that something that you discuss? A hundred percent. Supplements, you know, supplements are also very individualized. Um, I think that we um, are can be over, suppl uh, over supplemented at times because people just see the next biggest trend and, you know, oh, I need this, I need this. Um, definitely things that everyone is usually um, doesn't have enough is vitamin D. Um, I always do vitamin D3 with K2. Um, so always get those together and those have to be eaten with a fat source. Um, so your body absorbs it. Um, a B complex. Um, I tell people just to go ahead and get a methylated B complex because um, unless you're getting your homocysteine level or if you know if you have MTHFR, um, you don't necessarily know if you... MTFHR? Um, MTHFR. What is that? Um, so it's a, your body doesn't process um, methylated B or um, unmethylated B, comp or B vitamins and so you don't absorb it from the food and so you need methylation um, to absorb it um, so you have to get a methylated B complex okay. um, and then um, magnesium can be very helpful for sleep for any GI issues anxiety um, those are the three that I usually always um tell people and then if you need others then it's probably best to get some type of testing done to make sure that you're not just 
cherry picking and just fi- trying to figure it out and see if it does something for you. It's a waste of money. You're probably just peeing it out. Um, so I would get more testing done. Yeah, I was, I was hoping you would say that because, <laughs> you know, as a trainer, I get asked a lot about supplements mm-hmm. and I will say that the more experienced in this, the, you feel like the Dunning Kruger effect, right? Are you familiar with that? Like, in the beginning, you think you know everything, oh, mm-hmm. right? And then the longer you go, you realize you know less and less. Yes. And then, but then at some point, it starts to go back up. Mm-hmm. And I feel like I'm, I may be at the point where I'm starting. I've been doing personal training long enough to like know that I don't know very much. Mm-hmm. And one of those things is supplements. Yeah. So at this point in my personal training career, I guess you call it, when people ask me about supplements, I and because I'm not a doctor, mm-hmm. I don't pretend to be one. Nowhere near. A personal trainer, right? Right. And so when they ask me about supplements, you have to get the test. Yeah. You have to get blood work. Yeah. Otherwise, you could even, and this actually happened to me. This is why I'm so uh, kind of passionate about it. Mm-hmm. You, yeah. Unless you know, yeah. you could be putting yourself in danger. Correct. So testing is mm-hmm. what you need. Yes. To determine. Now, there are some, in, in a sound in a, Pre uh, perimenopause phase, these these few things that you mentioned are likely necessary. Yes, but then anything beyond that, you have to get the blood work. You have to get the blood work to know. Is there anything else other than cortisol that like uh, where a blood work situation is not valuable? Um, let me think. The cortisol. Um, I think that people don't realize about like your gut health. Um, people think that oh well, if I don't have constipation or bloating or diarrhea, then my gut's healthy. And so, getting um, a gut test is very important too. For a big picture, it's more of a functional medicine point of view. It's not you know traditional medicine. Conventional medicine doesn't do this, but that can be very helpful. Um, but I can't think off the top of my head of anything that's not. That you'd have to not get a blood test for. Okay, so but if you do, if you if you want to get tested mm-hmm. to know what's really going on inside, it sounds like you need the four way saliva test for cortisol. Correct. A gut health check. Ch- and how do you how do you do the the gut health? What does that test look like? It's a stool test. Stool test. Okay, mm-hmm. so you're going to mm-hmm. do a saliva test mm-hmm. for cortisol, a stool test mm-hmm. for the gut health, and then a full uh, blood panel. A full blood panel, and even there is what's, what's called HTMA. It's a hair tissue mineral analysis, and it looks at, um, so it's your hair, obviously, mm-hmm. um, and it looks at your nutrients, minerals, um, and even heavy metals um, because we're so exposed to heavy metals and just, um, you know, the environment and what we eat and plastics and all these things that um, it also can have detrimental on our hormones. So that can be helpful too. Wow, I think I want to do that. Yeah, yeah, that's that really cool. cool. Um, you know, anytime we talk about testing and stuff, people are like, oh, how much is it? Like, what uh, are these tests that you can get done pretty affordably? Or like, how much is something like this? If you were to do all this, like, how much something like that cost? So it, it really depends on who's doing it. And because insurance doesn't pay for it, mm-hmm. um, so it, it's typically cash pay. The HGMA is not that expensive, but then you have to have somebody read it. So you're paying for, you know, someone's expertise. Um, The GI test is more of a more expensive test, a few hundred dollars um, to get that that test. This is like a one-time test, though, and you... Typically one time, I mean, if you want to see if, you know, okay, you get your stool and then now this is the protocol based on what that shows, we're going to, you know, detox, we're going to get all of these bacterias back to where they need to be, we're going to get your acid um, back to where it needs to be, then you could test after if you wanted to, but if you're feeling better and things are improved, then it's not necessary. How long does it take to, to you know, you start this, this new supplement protocol because of these, or new, new lifestyle adjustments or whatever? Sure about how long, you know, until maybe you're seeing improvements? Um, So it depends because, you know, some people, if they have terrible bloating, for example, um, those people, once you change their protocol and change a few things in their life, they could notice a difference in a week or two. Um, Some people to go through a whole detox of like eight weeks, open up your detox pathways and then get some bacteria out. You know, we're talking three, four months. Um, It may be sooner that you notice a difference, Um, or it may be longer, you know, it just depends on kind of what else you're doing in your life. Are you changing your nutrition? Are you doing all of the things? Yeah. Well, let's, let's talk about that. Um, you know, we can stick with our two person situation here. We have the younger of our, of our two women here, 31 years old. 
um, struggling with uh, perimenopause symptoms. They implement all of these things. On average, how long does it take to start improving and like feel like yourself again kind of thing? I mean, I feel like that would be quick. You know, I'm within a month, you would probably notice um, a difference because we're working on your stress. You're sleeping better. You're, you know, waking up rested. So you have energy to work out. You're working out more efficiently. You're eating the nutrients your body needs. Um, so you're definitely going to notice pretty dang quickly um, an improvement in your overall just kind of well-being. What about, what about our older female? Um, so... I think that that kind of can vary on where we are and our state of um, perimenopause. How much stress have we caused in our life that we need to kind of get through? Um, how, you know, our detox pathways um, opening up. Um, so she still may feel a difference in a couple of weeks, but I would say um, it's going to take a little bit longer to get to that same kind of the way she felt back in her 20s. Um, it may take a couple of months. A couple of months. And mm -hmm. I would venture that the, the application of the things is more difficult. Right. For, for that person as well. Mm -hmm. You know, because mm -hmm. a lot of times, you know, I, when I'm talking to people in the gym and they're talking about how they've gained weight over time and stuff, you know, and maybe they're in their early 30s. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're eating more and you're exercising less and stuff, but also just life is harder. Yes. <laughs> the older that you get, yeah. you know, uh, until your kids leave for college or move out and all that stuff, probably mm -hmm. life gets harder. Like the responsibilities are different. That's a big reason that people gain weight through their mid, late 20s and early 30s is yep. you got bills. <laughs> you got bills yep. now. You got a boss telling you what to do. You got all these other stresses mm -hmm. that you got to keep up with. There's kids. So that all play, right. plays a factor. A more sedentary lifestyle probably. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, it definitely, the stress alone. I mean, stress causes so much inflammation in our body that um, that alone is detrimental to our gut health, our lo losing weight, um, all of the things that we've just discussed. So um really getting your inflammation down is is also very important. And a lot of that is through the nutrition piece. Correct. I'm, yeah. Nutrition, diet. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, um, stress reduction. Yeah. Uh, and maybe we can kind of wrap up with a little bit of that. You mentioned meditation. Um, if you have any specific um, protocols that you recommend for that would be great. Um, any other small lifestyle adjustments that – you know, someone's listening to this and they feel like they're struggling with, you know, the things that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, any other kind of small things that they can implement it into their lifestyle that may may help them out? Sure. Um, there's a few meditation apps. Um, I can't think of any off the top of my head, but those that kind of can take you through some of those brain waves, the theta brain waves uh, sounds, um, those can be really um, helpful even for a 10, 15 minute period. Um, I think finding something that you enjoy doing um, whatever that looks like, whether that's reading a book, going and sitting outside for 10 minutes um, by yourself, um, getting off of your phone, getting off of social media, um, something even as little as laying up against the wall, like with your um, legs up in the air. So you're laying on the floor, on your back, scoot your booty as close to the wall as you can, Put your legs up. That can help kind of get some blood flow differently and lay there for 10, 15 minutes. Um, take some deep breaths, and that can also kind of help you relax. Um, those little things can really um, make a difference in our stress response. Yeah, and I think a lot of times in situations like this, very similar to, to working out and losing weight, it doesn't happen when you do it once. No. <laughs> you have to... Do it consistently over a period of time. Yes, it is a lifestyle change. Yeah, and that, that is just very difficult um, for a lot of people to implement. Mm -hmm. But it sounds like this is not impossible. It's not impossible. It is very possible to mm -hmm. overcome these issues, these symptoms. 100%. And I even tell women, you know, I'll have them write a letter to their future self. So you, this is who, you know, you're feeling like right now. So let's write a letter to who you're going to be once we get you feeling better, once we get you sleeping and your anxiety is under control and, you know, you're feeling back to who you know you can be. 
So we're going to write a letter to her, and then when we're done with this whole process, we're going to read it and see how close we got. Um, And that can also be really empowering for women because it's hard to picture going from A to B, you know. So it's like you can't see the other side, and you don't know how great you're going to feel um, because you just are so stuck in where you are right now. And so taking these little bitty steps, starting to exercise, make small changes in your diet, decreasing your stress, getting better sleep, all of these things over time are definitely going to be an improvement and you're going to have a better quality of life. Couldn't have said it any better. Sean, do you have any, do you have any way to follow that up? I'm just mind blown. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that was, yeah. That was I great. Really, yeah. I yeah. don't really have much to say. I'm just, uh, yeah, yeah. it's a, definitely a lot of information, a lot that I didn't know, um, for sure, but I yeah. appreciate you. Yeah. And really that, that's that's a, that's a great, um, thing for anyone. Yes. You don't have to be s- suffering through nope. menopause or perimenopause to, to benefit from something like that. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Right. Exactly. And so, uh, but sometimes when we're in these situations, when you're in the thick of life, yeah, you know, yes. just trying to live it, it's just like, man, I, you, you are super stressed. Yeah. You are, you know, there's so much going on. It's like, you really, it's hard to take the time and just be like, <sighs> yeah. <laughs> you know? 100%. Like, yeah. Yeah. it feels impossible yeah. to it see impossible. point B, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. So, Awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. We really no, appreciate y'all. your time. This um, was fun. Yeah. Awesome. I'm glad you <laughs> liked it. Um, yeah, guys, we're here to help Houston make its way up the ladder of health and fitness. So I hope that this information was helpful to you. Please consider sharing, subscribing. Um, do you want to, uh, any social profiles or websites, anything that you want to say? Yep. You can follow me on Instagram at Kristen Lee Wellness. It's K-R-I-S-T-I-N-L-E-I-G-H Wellness. Awesome. Well, guys, we'll see you next time. Thank you. Peace.